Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Geographic Society of Chicago's Women in Geography webinar series. I'm your host, Nicolette Marasa from the GSC office, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. But today, uh, our webinar presenter is Linda C. Samuels, Interim Director of the College of Architecture at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for being with us today and presenting on infrastructural optimism, design strategies for next generation systems. Thank you, Nic Nicolette, and thank you to the Society for inviting me. I'm a little bit of an honorary geographer. My, bra my background is actually originally undergrad in architecture, grad in architecture, and then actually 20 years between my graduate degree and my PhD in urban planning. But I got lots of opportunities to work with some really interesting people in the geography field. So I'm going to share my screen and start there. Can you see that? Yes, looks great. Okay, great. Um, so we're, we're a small group here on the webinar today. And so really feel free to, to type in some questions. Um, I told Nicolette I'm unexpectedly traveling, so I don't have two screens, so I can't actually see the chat at the same time, but, um, happy to have a conversation at the end of this. Uh, I also realize that this group is not really the normal group I talk to. As an urban designer and architect, I'm often talking with designers. So people who are um, everything from the scale of, you know, the park bench all the way up to the city. So um, certainly some of you might overlap with that as well. And I know geography is a big umbrella and I appreciate that about geography. Um, but one thing I thought I would do is like I add a little I added a little bit of the theory behind this work to the beginning of the presentation. So um, I'm going to go into that just a little bit and then move into the projects that I've done with students and the research I've been doing on my own as a professor. So um, as Nicolette said, I'm the interim director of the College of Architecture and Graduate School of Architecture, Landscape Architecture and Urban Design at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm also the new chair of urban designs. So this has been a big change for the last like couple of months for me. And, and I'm a professor. So I've been at WashU for eight years and my book, Infrastructural Optimism has been out for just over a year, but the work has been going on probably for a decade. So some of what you'll see is that background. And I'm sure for those of you out there who have been writing, uh, you know that it's a long process. So this is part of the sort of theoretical background of the research, which is why I wanted to include it. And what you see here is what I call the lineage diagram of infrastructural urbanism. Uh, the top row is sort of the resources and seminal events that occurred in the field of architecture that I argue lead us to this point of infrastructural urbanism, which is sort of the urbanism I say we're currently in. The bottom row is the contribution from landscape architecture, which is often now being taught as landscape urbanism. And then the middle is urban design with urban planning sort of sprinkled in between the two. And so I came into this picture probably around, I don't know if you can see on the screen, but around 2008, 2009, when I went back to school to get my PhD in urban planning at UCLA, and I was a senior research associate at City Lab. Um, we ran a competition called WPA 2.0, and I will get into that competition in a little bit, but one of the reasons why 2008, 2009 was an interesting moment for this, in addition to the very large scale infrastructural failures that we were seeing uh, around the world, but specifically in the US, Hurricane Katrina and Rita, the, um, the US Northeast power outage that impacted about 35 million people, the collapse of the I-35 West Bridge, also having an economic uh, recession at the time in 2008, 2009. So we had a lot of unemployed architects and construction professionals. But the other thing I think is of interest was this moment of change in the discourse. So this is sort of emerged out of uh, that moment in the uh, 2008, 2009, 2010. We were sort of in a postmodern pessimistic period in around um, 1990, in the 1990s. So you might remember Michael Sorkin's work variations on a theme park, which was really focused on the sort of thematization, sterilization, militarization of the city, and Joel, um, Joel Garreau's work, which was really about the sort of like uber suburb 
Well, we came out of that in the early 2000s with these other ideas of what urbanism could be, right? It could be everyday urbanism, which was more tactical, small scale, uh, grassroots, getting into a problem and trying to solve it in a weekend or overnight that could generate other ideas, right? Uh, sort of people centric. Uh, landscape urbanism, which was really thinking about climate change and um, ecological systems. And of course, new urbanism, which was thinking, um, among other things, about walkability. And I think that's the aspect of new urbanism that's really interesting in the work that I've been doing. So all of these primary urbanisms had what I call prodigy. So landscape urbanism uh, introduced us to these ideas from Stan Allen, points and lines, where we started to think about infrastructure as an architectural system, or ecological urbanism, again, that really starts to think about um, strategies of responding to climate change. And then uh, everyday urbanism, where we have the whole insurgent urbanism, tactical urbanism movement, which I think one of the main projects of that that's been hugely successful is Times Square, where we see people like Jeanette Sadik Khan, who was the transportation director, come in and use tactical strategies to create large change. And then, of course, new urbanism, which uh, introduced walkability as a kind of financial model um, with Jeff Speck's book, Walkable City. So... All of these things were sort of the, the disciplinary background for how we started to talk about infrastructure in a new way. And I wanted to show this series of diagrams, mostly because it's in my book. And I think it's an interesting way to think about this moment where kind of in the same way Rosalind Krauss in the late seventies was saying, well, sculpture isn't really landscape and isn't really architecture. It's kind of not landscape and not architecture. I'm trying to think of the same thing when I was writing my book. Well, you know, infrastructure isn't really architecture and it's not really urbanism and it's not really landscape. So the series of um, diagrams I did really led me to thinking about infrastructure as a series of fields, systems, and ecologies working in symbiosis. And then in addition to that, I started to think about the kind of spatial justice aspects that come from my background in planning, specifically working with Ed Soja at UCLA. And those components, which are um, in that pink, justice, democracy, publicness, and engagement. So this is sort of the background theory of what um, how I got to this definition of infrastructural urbanism. So it is a type of urbanism that has these qualities. It's integrated rather than segregated, networked rather than autonomous, inclusive rather than elitist, flexible rather than rigid, cross and multidisciplinary, bottom up as well as top down, ecological as well as economical and outcome driven. So more about performance rather than object focused. So um, that's the like intellectual theoretical grounding for the work that I've been doing really for the last 10 years that sort of coalesced around the book in the last three to four primarily. And the name infrastructural optimism came from an article that I wrote um, when I was wrapping up my PhD for Places Journal. And what I was drawn to about that article was this idea that optimism is necessary for changing the future, right? And that as people who work in design fields, so as architects, landscape architects, urban designers, and urban planners, we are working with the belief that our contributions are always moving towards a better future. So I, I think it's it's ironic and sort of amazing that Al Gore is a person who says something like, I always come down on the side of hope. And he didn't say this when he was elected to be vice president. He actually said this in 2016, which is sort of phenomenal because in 2016, our country elected a president who withdrew the U.S. from the Paris Climate Accord, which was one of Al Gore's signature accomplishments. And Al Gore said this because he said, oh, yeah, you know, this horrible thing is happening. But what's actually happening is the governors of the states in the U.S. are rising up to meet the challenge where the federal government is falling short. And electric vehicles are, are more readily available than they've ever been. And solar panels and solar batteries are lower cost than they've ever been. So he is optimistic then and now that we are still coming down on the side of hope. So I talk about strategies to get to this uh, moment of opportunity, infrastructural opportunity. And I, I call this uh, infrastructural optimism. I call this infrastructural opportunism. And the idea for infrastructural opportunism is that we are investing large amounts of money regardless of the outcome already. So if we were leveraging those billions of dollars on greater social and environmental gains, we could be utilizing these opportunities for higher levels of performance for people in the environment. And the shorthand for this is we got to move from the red arrow 
scenario to the green arrow scenario. Like we cannot be designing infrastructure like we have been for the last 50 years. So what does this mean? So we have to move from what I call last generation infrastructure to next generation infrastructure. And last generation infrastructure is infrastructure which is extremely resource intensive. It is often spatially and socially disruptive. It is environment can be environmentally damaging and typically does one thing at a time. And sometimes it doesn't do that thing so well. Um, next generation infrastructure actually contributes to the reduction of these damages that were caused by previous generations of infrastructure. It recognizes infrastructure as a public amenity. It introduces systems-based thinking so that we understand that trees and water and sidewalks and buses all happen in shared collective geographies. And it utilizes interdisciplinary thinking and collaboration across agencies to improve the quality of life for everyone. So I mentioned that um, when I went to City Lab, I worked on this competition, WPA 2.0. And the competition was a call for interdisciplinary teams. And many of those teams were student teams, about half were student teams, about half were professional teams. And we had 320 entries. And the idea was to seek innovative solutions for design-based responses that would be worthy of the national level effort to revitalize cities and put the public back in public work. So that was kind of our tagline. Um, like I said, we had 320 entries. This is a sample of some of those entries. And as I started to look at really the entries that rose to the top, I was seeking commonalities among those entries. Um, these are the five finalists. Uh, one of the things that many of the projects had in common was an emphasis on water. We know in the last 10 years in particular, we've been paying a lot more attention to drought conditions in Arizona, Southern California, but now in places that we weren't expecting drought before. Um, there was an emphasis on food, there was an emphasis on flexibility, and then in the um, winning design that you see here, Carbon Tap, Tunnel, Algae Park, the idea for this actual proposal was that we had a tunnel system that was already connecting Manhattan, Governor's Island, and Brooklyn, and the cars in those tunnels were producing CO2. And how could we capture that CO2? How could we capture a waste product and use that product as a fuel for something positive? So these pivot arm bridges have pods where that CO2 is captured, that CO2 is turned into the fuel for algae, that algae is then in, turned into biofuels. So in addition, these pivot arms come together when there's no boats getting through, and they become uh, connectors for pedestrians and bikes to be able to uh, walk across that space rather than having to drive. So working symbiotically, creating a multifunctional piece of architecture, um, and infrastructure and also being high performance. So looking at those projects, I started generating the first seven of the next gen infrastructure. So instead of last gen, next gen has to be multifunctional, right? We can no longer afford to do one thing at a time. It has to be public, where public life happens, not just where public dollars are spent. It helps if it's visible so that we understand where our resources are going and how we are collectively responsible for conserving or preserving those resources. It should be socially productive so we are more evenly distributing benefits and reducing negative externalities, but also including people in the decision-making process. It should be locally specific, flexible, and adaptable. So if we look at our highway system now, we know it's extremely rigid. And as we project a future with no cars and an optimistic future or fewer cars or different kinds of cars, um, it's very difficult to adapt that system. It should be sensitive to the eco economy so that we are actually paying attention to the cost to our environment in addition to the costs in terms of an economic bottom line and driven by design. And by that, I mean, how do we actually think about um, human occupation and human experience and consider infrastructure as something that might be positively used as a prototype? Um, after working with students at the University of Arizona, where I ran the Sustainable City Project and at Washington University, where I teach, as I said, in architecture and urban design um, and doing consulting work, and looking at case studies for the book, the list expanded. So the next four next-gen infrastructure really should be symbiotic, like that carbon tap project. So using the outputs of one system for the fuel in another so that there's no waste. 
it needs to be technologically smart so that we're not cheating and asking technology to do things for us that we should be doing for ourselves, but that we're finding new efficiencies, we're creating high performance responses, and we're um, using that technology as a way to elevate the other next generation infrastructure criteria. Um, developed collaborative, collaboratively across disciplines and agencies. So this is something that in practice, I think is pretty challenging, but in the work I'll show you that I've been doing in Los Angeles, we've really reaped the benefits of having different kinds of agencies talk to each other. And as someone who teaches interdisciplinary studio and in interdisciplinary schools, we really recognize the importance of that interconnectivity. And then lastly, operating at micro and macro scales. And I think we sort of surprisingly saw this during the pandemic where people really realized that their large networks and systems of infrastructure were not available to them. So they started making bread at home, you know, increasing their uh, reliance on solar power, uh, homesteading, creating their own masks, you know, small micro economies. So those, um, those give us further resilience and keep us from relying so heavily on the um, large scale governmental systems. Um, so I like to show this project. Uh, it was one of the finalists in the WPA 2.0 competition. Um, and it's one of my favorite projects. And what you see here is an example from Border Walls Infrastructure. But you might have actually seen some of the videos from this project. And I sort of joke that this is um, one of the few projects, actually the only project of the first uh of the first finalist that actually got built. So Ron Rayel took a prototype of one of his border walls infrastructure projects, slid it between the slats in the border wall between the US and Mexico. And for about two hours, you had kids in Mexico and kids in the US riding this teeter totter. Um, so how do we get to next generation infrastructure? Uh, my three strategies, broaden the process, measure what matters, transform the prototype so that we can shift the paradigm. Um, and I've mentioned these things in the criteria, but I'll give you some examples. So what do, I, what do I mean by broadening the process? I mean, early on being inclusive with a wider range of stakeholders who might provide input that's not common to, to infrastructure. So including arts organizations, cultural organizations, nonprofits, foundations, entrepreneurs, so that you get creative thinking from a variety of different perspectives. Um, one example of this, a project that I ran out of WashU uh, called Mobility for All by All. I worked with um, two other people, Matt Bernstein and Panina Laker. We took the majority of our grant and we were trying to get community engaged feedback for a new North Side, South Side Metrolink. And we gave that money to local arts organizations and asked them to engage their communities. So Antoinette Carroll runs something called Creative Reaction Lab, and she trained five high school teens to learn how to do um, community engagement themselves, so they had that skill. Um, our next team founded something called Social Impact Project, S-E-W-C-I-A-L, so they taught young kids how to sew. And then Sunny Hutton ran a project called So Fresh, So Clean, So Creative in Dutchtown, and she worked with... Um, an artist who is a hip hop artist who went on the bus and created a project called Hip Hop Transit with Bus Riders. Um, so the second uh, aspect of so the second strategy, I think getting to shifting the paradigm is measuring what matters. And oftentimes we use a strategy that looks at GDP as the answer. So GDP, genuine domestic, uh, uh, domestic product is actually really a gross domestic product, pro sorry, is really about growth, right? Growth, even growth for the sake of growth, because every dollar in GDP counts as a good dollar. GPI, on the other hand, um, that wheel you see on the bottom left, genuine progress indicator actually takes other things into account. So GPI differentiates good dollars from bad dollars. So going to war, GDP says is a plus. Going to war, GPI recognizes that loss of life can count as a negative. Um, incarceration counts as a negative. Uh, uh, disruption of infrastructure counts as a negative. So um, polluting water, polluting air, those things in GPI count as a negative. So what you see here is a diagram of a neighborhood that we analyzed that the city of St. Louis was arguing was a positive because they were increasing tax revenue. And we said, well, look at all the social cohesion you're disrupting. So we looked at the neighborhoods that were being, uh, the neighbors that were being displaced. We looked at the community ties that were being lost. We looked at the jobs and the businesses that were being lost and the community events that were being lost. And we said, this is a cost. This is a cost to this neighborhood. 
Uh, the third strategy is transforming the prototype. So I mentioned symbiosis, where the waste of one product is the fuel for another. The diagram you see on the left, Kallenborg symbiosis, is the largest industrial symbiosis in the world. So uh, they are in Kallenborg, Kallenborg in Denmark, and they are 20, originally 20 independent manufacturers who got together and decided that we were going to find ways for every single material to be reused on that site. So it is a no waste, entirely symbiotic production uh, sequence. This uh, We applied this kind of strategy to the project that you see on the right. A uh, group of students of mine entered a competition uh, by the Van Allen Institute and AECOM that asked for um, a, a governmental institution that had a need and another system that might have a compatible need if you thought about them symbiotically. So we paired the Postal Service, which at the time was closing some of their um, Postal Service locations and had an excess of postal vehicles with a partner called Food Forward, who I still work with. And Food Forward recovers and redistributes over 60 million pounds of fresh produce every year. And when we first met with them, they said, we could provide fresh produce for everyone in LA if we had enough storage and enough vehicles. So we said, hey, USPS, Food Forward, let's put you together. Um, we won this competition. And I will say that the Postal Service has absolutely no interest in food or distributing food. But we have had impact. I'm still working with Food Forward. And we have um, a friend in St. Louis who became a friend through this project who bought a surplus postal vehicle and delivers fresh fruits and produce for free with that vehicle. Um, uh, just one more project that I worked on that also transforms the prototype. I, I taught a studio on Hyperloop. And what we realized is that there are cities that have a lot of resources and cities that have fewer resources. And this, again, became really evident in the pandemic when we were looking at hospital beds. And if we had some higher speed interconnectivity network around the U.S., a sort of like turbo um, highway system that was also non-fossil fuel based and was much more reliant on uh, renewable energy, then we could distribute those resources more quickly. So two projects that are in the book, and I just want to show you a couple examples from each. They're really different scales. They're really different kinds of projects. Um, uh, the I-11 Super Corridor is a 500-mile interstate project that connects the border of the U.S. and Mexico with Las Vegas and all the cities in between. And I don't know if you realize that Phoenix and Las Vegas are two of the largest, two of the fastest growing cities in the U.S., and they are also two cities of their scale that are not connected by a highway. So they were not big enough in the 1950s when the original freeway map was drawn. So Interstate 11 is partially about connecting those two highways, but it's also about inducing growth. Um, the Northside Southside Metrolink in St. Louis is about 17 miles and it is a new um, light rail project that would supplement the existing east-west rail. And it is really a project that's about um, creating equity. So the red arrow to green arrow scenario in the I-11 super corridor is the statement, you know, if we're going to spend 17 to $75 million per lane per mile, we should be doing something better than what they call the flat and black, right? The straight um, highway. So this is the, this is the map of the route. You can see Tucson, Phoenix, and Las Vegas are on this map. And I was in Tucson at the University of Arizona. We had uh, academic partners at ASU and UNLV, and we had a class of about 60 students. So they were architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, and planning, and about five faculty members. And we took on this project for a semester and then carried through for the summer. And these are all the partners that we worked with. We worked with the nonprofit Snorin Institute. We worked with the Walton Sustainable Solutions Initiative, who helped fund the project, and the Renewable Energy Network, who also helped fund the project and the Departments of Transportation. So it's important that ADOT in particular, NDOT also, but Arizona Department of Transportation was in on this from the very beginning. Uh, we did research first, like we do in all of our projects. So um, there was a mention at the beginning about GIS and other geospatial uh, research strategies. So we do a lot of mapping. These are just two examples. And two of the most important um, resources and infrastructural systems we needed to look at in the state of Arizona and Southern Nevada. One is solar, and you can see all of the red on that map is high solar potential, and the other is water. So the water 
uh, that serves Southern Arizona and Las Vegas is from the Colorado River, and there's 336 miles of the of the um, uh, canal that runs that water to those cities. And if you know about energy and water, you know there's this energy water nexus. So it takes energy to move water. It takes water to cool down the plants that make energy. So if we can reduce our energy use, we can reduce our water needs. So it was very important to look at these two resources and the infrastructure that is either utilizing them or not. Um, so we had a series of about 11 sites in the cities from Nogales to Las Vegas. And I'm just going to show you one or two of these. This is Tucson, and the goal of the students was to look at that column on the left, that's the infrastructure condition currently existing. And then the hot pink is where they proposed an increase in the infrastructure. So we did research again, some demographic research, economic statistics, population and transportation information. And the site in Tucson is um, the I-11 and where it, um, where it intersects specifically with one of the main streets of the city. And this group, I, I had them work in what I call the competition format. So they did a series of boards. These are two of their three boards. They had three weeks to do these boards. Um, they came up with this concept of energy city. And their idea is every single way we can produce renewable energy and every single way we can harvest water. In addition, they wanted to come up with a new economy for Tucson. So as you saw, it's um, one of the top 10 poorest cities in the country, and this was a way to generate high wage jobs. So you can see here that they're really thinking about this intersection, um, Congress Street and the new I-11 as a sort of hub of renewable energy and energy intelligence. Um, these are all renderings that they created for that competition board. Um, there is a high speed rail line or at least a medium speed rail line that would connect uh, Tucson, Phoenix, Las Vegas. This is a smart road, a digital road where it has sensors and give, provides information. And then every building has some sort of cover that produces energy and um, reduces heat by being also a, a green surface. Um, this was the first time I experimented with this. And this is part of the effort of measuring what matters. We do this project, what do we get out of it? So this takes the energy produced and says, well, this is what we would use that energy for. We would store it. We would use it for car share. We would support the streetcar. We would have a couple hotels. We would have some office buildings. All of the um, air conditioning, because it's very hot, you know, we're at the point in Arizona where we're heading towards 100 days over 100 degrees. Um, we would, in addition to collecting the rainwater in the monsoons, we would collect any of the water that might come from the air conditioning condensate. We would recharge the river, and that river would also create a microclimate, uh, animal habitat, and recreational space. Um, a second site in the same project is Marana, and the Marana site is a little more wealthy. It's, it's about halfway between Phoenix and Tucson. It's kind of a, a, a bedroom community of Tucson. Uh, they have water rights from being a previously farming agricultural area where they grew cotton. So this project said, okay, we want to conserve as much of that water as we have and create sort of a, a vegetated community where it would be sort of a, um, a water collection, smart facade, digital high tech, uh, academic educational environment that also uh, gathers and stores this water and creates a greenway. So this high, where the highway goes through here, reduced car usage, increased transportation, again, that high speed or medium speed rail. And then all of this harvest water can create this sort of campus for the academic environment where people learn about water conservation, water purification, uh, green space, heat island reduction, and there's also bike share, streetcar, all of those. Again, we measured what matters. How much energy are we producing? How much water are we saving? And what is that water going to? Um, and then a, a third and final project. Um, one of the projects was at the intersection. One of the sites was at the intersection of um, Interstate 8, Interstate 11, and a railroad. And this was the time when Tesla was looking for a new gigafactory. So we said, oh, this is going to be a perfect spot. So you can kind of see that location here. Um, this site, the design project for this was really an entire field of solar that had a green space underneath it. So it doesn't look like I have the actual project here, but in the end, we totaled up what, what did this all add up to? And even if we just put in the rail, just um, increase the density, 
of the way people lived instead of typical suburban Southern Arizona planning and increased electric vehicles, we would save 2.1 million metric tons of CO2. Plus, if we do all the green arrow stuff on the right, we would have an entirely different sort of um, strategy for living in Southern Arizona and, uh, in Arizona and Southern Nevada. So the second project is the project in St. Louis. And again, this project was called Mobility for All by All. We were funded by a Divided Cities grant, uh, which is a Mellon Foundation grant. So those are a combination of um, uh, architecture, urban design, landscape architecture, and the humanities. And you see here again, we had a very diverse team. So people within our field, but also uh, by state development, which is our regional transit organization, Citizens for Modern Transit, who are bike and pet advocates, GIS experts, um, local artists, like I mentioned before, um, whole, and a, a couple of student assistants. If you're not familiar with St. Louis, it's one of the um, only cities in the country that is not in its county. So they had what's called the Great Divorce at the end of the 1800s, um, and the city and the county separated. So they are still in competition with each other. So they're often in competition for resources and for people. The city of St. Louis reached its peak population at the um, at around 1949, and that was uh, 875,000. It has been dropping since then. So if you see that uh, that chart on the bottom, that's the peak of the city population, and then the drop. The drop was anticipated to be around 308,000 in the last census. It was closer to 300,000. So it's dropped a little more than we thought. The other uh, curve on that bottom chart is the population in the county. So the county population has been rising. So the regional population is staying pretty stable. The new, the new north side, south side line is in red on the left. And this is a little bit of data about it. 17 miles, 15 wards, 23 neighborhoods. 29 stations at about $2 billion. And like I mentioned previously, a lot of this is, um, is really uh, an equity line. So if you're familiar with the notorious pruitt Igo housing complex, uh, um, you know one of the most complicated housing complexes in the US was demolished in 1972 due to a, a, an unfortunate history of first urban renewal, which erased um, 20,000 African-American residents of this portion of St. Louis, but then neglect from the city and federal investment in the Pruitt-Igo housing complex that um, ended up in degradation of the project. Uh, that's, you can see how close it is to the north side, south side line. The image that you see to the right of that is actually a project that is going up now. So it is the National Geospatial Agency, and it is one of the reasons I say we're still making the same mistakes in terms of urban renewal that we did 70 years ago. A little bit of demographic information. So the top is North St. Louis, the bottom is South St. Louis, and the middle is average. But what I want to point out is that over 40% of the population's, the household on the North side lives below the poverty line, and about 36% of those households have no vehicle. Um, this is a shocking statistic. I know when I first heard this about St. Louis, I was just, it was unbelievable to me, but now I've heard it about so many other cities. You know, zip code does often unfortunately predict life expectancy. So you see the highest average life expectancy in the census tract, the highest census tract on the west side of St. Louis and the county is 87 and the lowest in North City is about 69.7 or 70. So that 17 year difference of life expectancy is, is quite extreme. Again, my students do a lot of mapping. So this these are the maps we started uh, and I think I only have uh, three or four sets in this PowerPoint um, and this PDF, but uh, we want to understand what's been happening in this neighborhood historically. So this set of maps looks at what we call the legacies of urban renewal and segregation. So all the red on the left is sites that are um, either vacant sites or vacant houses. And I always like to say vacancy is not vacant, right? It's There is a history there. They are not empty. Um, on the right are, are a combination of the effects of urban renewal and other kinds of uh, racially discriminatory covenants. So every red layer is another either um, impact of urban renewal, eminent domain, or racial covenant. So the darker the red, the more of, of those sort of sets of violence that have happened on that site. 
Um, this is some environmental mapping. So on the right, you see incidences of lead, the darker, and this is measured in school drinking water, the darker, the red, the higher levels of lead. And on the left, you can see the yellow is the areas in the city um, where the federal government has imposed a consent decree because of our combined sewer and stormwater. So this is the area of emphasis where those combined sewer and stormwaters need to be separated because every time we get a flood event, you have houses and businesses where the flood, um, stormwater flooding also backs up the sewer and you end up with sewage in your backyard or your basement. This map is about, uh, we called it Opportunity Corridors. The title that we have for the set is Economic Violence. So you can see the majority of investment is in that central east-west corridor. So those X's and um, yellow circles, the yellow circles are tax increment financing investment. The X's are either Fortune 500 companies or eds and meds, educational facilities or medical facilities. So lots of investment and growth in St. Louis along that central corridor, also called the Park to Arch. So um, Forest Park to the, to the St. Louis Arch. The Northern area and the Southern area are getting less, less investment. So these are federal promise zones or HUD choice neighborhoods. And this is where more investment needs to happen. Um, and where we've identified um, the, based on sort of economic level, unemployment information, that kind of thing, where we should be investing more. So we put that data together. The students actually built this beautiful model that consolidated that data and helped us identify where the sites of most significance might be. And what you see on the map to the left is four identified sites where the students intervened and created design proposals. So we have two on the north side um, and two on the south side. Um, karst urbanism is one of the ones on the south side. And um, we have a, a, a karst landscape in St. Louis, which is a cave landscape. So this group started to look at how those, how that cave environment might be utilized and daylighted to harvest water and create a water economy. Um, they have also taken the next generation infrastructure criteria. We have a series of icons, one that goes with each criteria and they use those to inspire their design work. So they're working with the criteria and designing to the criteria, but then I'm also asking them to identify the criteria so that they can communicate them to other people and to begin to measure how those criteria are um, being effective in terms of performance. So 60,000 people fed or 95% of stormwater capture, this is another way to measure what matters. Um, second project, two rivers. So one of the rivers is the Mississippi River. The other river is the Northside Southside Metrolink. And this group looked at a area that was um, actually had a lot of barge activity. And they said, well, we're gonna take these barges after they're used fill them with soil that's um, contaminated, remediate that soil, and then use that remediated soil to create a sort of micro-agricultural economy. So this is higher density, um, walkable environment. So this kind of cycle of food production, uh, food sales, soil remediation, and transit's all happening in this location. And then the third project, I think only three of the four are in here, uh, this is a North City project, and North St. Louis is really culturally rich. So um, Sumner High School is a pretty famous high school. People like Tina Turner and B.B. King graduated from Sumner. Arthur Ashe, famous um, African-American tennis player. And a lot of this culture is lost in the narrative of North St. Louis being a place of poverty. So this group... Um, invested in the preservation of this culture and used next generation infrastructure, including technology as a way to communicate the history of this neighborhood to anyone who might pass through and to draw people to this neighborhood. Um, so in 2020, the summer of 2020, I think the sort of social unrest that was already very um, uh, prominent in the St. Louis landscape, um, you know, we are near Ferguson, uh, Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson and North St. Louis. And so this is a, a conscious place where a lot of actions have occurred where Black Lives Matter is one of the origin points of Black Lives Matter. I think the um, summer of 2020, that rising really made us think about the role that infrastructure has played in our history. And um, infrastructure, like we see here, the plaza, the Black Lives Matter plaza is one moment, one kind of effort to make this kind of infrastructure visible, but it also isn't really enough, right? So next-gen infrastructure criteria number 12 says, you know, how do we repair the damage of infrastructure where it has divided communities, created excessive negative externalities, reduced 
health of neighboring um, residents and taken away amenities? And how do we actually contribute to solving those problems rather than increasing and exacerbating them? So all 12 together, number 12 is reparative, taking into account the institutional damages done intentionally and unintentionally to humans and non-humans and repairing those discrepancies and damages to take steps to amend them. Um, so I, I was lucky enough to go on sabbatical, not this past year, but the year before. And I followed up with some of the case studies that I had been working on for the book, um, partnered with the Bureau of Engineering in the city of Los Angeles, because I had interviewed them about the Sixth Street Viaduct. And this project is a replacement for the historical Sixth Street Bridge that was one of the series of historical bridges built in the 20s and 30s in LA over the LA River. But what was really interesting about this project is it could have been done by the California Department of Transportation. But the woman who leads the Bureau of Engineering or kind of second in command, Deborah Weintraub, is the head architect also for the city. And Deborah convinced the city to have a design competition. And so the entrance to the design competition had to have an architect a landscape architect, as well as an engineering firm. So the project that won the Sixth Street Viaduct by Michael Maltzen, HTMB, and Hargraves is really a, a kind of working example of a next generation infrastructure project. So in addition to being the bridge that you see that crosses and connects these two neighborhoods, uh, it is the most advanced earthquake-proof bridge in the country um, and maybe approaching the world. It is entirely on isolators and can move, I think, up to um, 24 inches in any direction. It actually works as a as a running trail, as a workout space. So the the sidewalk and the stairways together create kind of a path that that is a 5K. You can run up the bridge and down the bridge. It has multimodal opportunities. So it's got bike, pedestrian, and cars. It was designed to be closed off for actually for protests and other social activities, and it really has been a site where um, Boyle Heights residents and East LA residents who are, uh, have low riders clubs and motorcyclist groups have come and occupied the bridge in a way that's really exciting. And then all the space under the bridge, which is 12 acres of new public space in the city of LA, is a combination of public spaces that were generated by um, years of community engagement. So there's um, uh, dog parks and things like that, but there's also basketball courts, there's an amphitheater, um, there's uh, particularly a walking trail for older adults that were vocal in the conversation from East LA, from Boyle Heights. Um, there's also future planning here for transit. Right now there is passenger rail and heavy rail that goes through here, but doesn't stop here. But I think the fore forethought from Deborah was, there's gonna be transit here in some day, the LA River is important, let's be ready for it. Um, so that working on that case study with her was sort of an inroad to me going to Los Angeles for my um, sabbatical. And I did two projects while I was there. And I'm going to end by showing you these two projects. One is a continued work with Food Forward. They were the group that distributes the 60 million pounds of fruits and vegetables every year. And um, I just said, I, I care about you guys. I like working with you guys. What can I do with you while I'm there? And um, they really have been trying to measure what matters. And so what we found out was that we, we needed to define the question together. And the first question was, how does it really work? Like, where does the food come from and where does the food go? What path do we want it to take? So we did a bunch of diagramming for them, which you see on the right. Um, these are their three programs, wholesale recovery, farmer's market, and backyard harvest. Ideally, it goes to their produce pit stop if it's coming from wholesale or it goes directly to agencies if it's coming from backyard harvest or farmer's market. It can then go directly to an agency from the pit stop or to a produce hub and then to an agency. But what they wanted to also know was like how much food and where we're going geographically. So we worked in Tableau and we first hired um, three interns. Two of those interns came from Occidental and they helped clean up all the data. And one of the, one of the interns was an architect and urban design student that had graduated from my program at WashU. And we created a map uh, of every program, um, some graphs that show quantities of food and types of food. And what you see here in blue is the agency and in green is the food uh, supplier. So this is a screenshot showing the backyard harvest program. And if you were, if it was live and you clicked on any of these um, bubbles, you would show 
via pounds of food. So either pounds of food given, if it's a if it's a orange bubble, or pounds of food received by the agency if it's a blue bubble. And then the last project I worked on was with Deborah at the Bureau of Engineering, and we decided we were going to create an infrastructure equity scorecard pilot project. And what we said is um, Mayor Garcetti had had created an executive directive that asked every agency in the city to put equity first. What would that look like? And so we said, well, how are we making decisions about who gets investments in infrastructure? Um, it's kind of a lot of backroom deals. It's a lot of people who are well-connected and it shouldn't be. It should be the places that need it the most. So we interviewed 16 different groups who were already working on equity initiatives in the city to find out um, what technology they were using, what kind of process they were going through, how they were defining equity. Um, we got, we uh, consolidated that into a major report, 65 pages of report. And then we said, well, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for engineering? And the first thing we did was, well, what does it mean to create equity with infrastructure, right? So these diagrams are probably familiar to all of you. Um, we wanted to go not just equality, not just give everyone a step up, we wanted to at least get to equity where everyone got high enough to see over the fence. And ultimately the long-term goal is justice. So the categories in the middle, that middle column, it starts at the bottom. And as you go higher and higher to the top, you get a more just infrastructural um, condition. So first you equalize minimum functionality, right? Everybody needs to have clean water. Then you prioritize the underserved neighborhoods so that those neighborhoods who have, who have had polluted water for the longest time get their um, needs prioritized. And then you invest in holistic systems, right? So it's great to have water, but we also have to have, you know, um, good quality public space and high quality trees and, um, you know, a food system that works. Then you dismantle destructive systems, right? So this backroom deals where everybody's making decisions without people's voices is not really the way to go. We transfer power by giving people a voice. And then ev eventually we get to next generation infrastructure. So that kind of turned into this four column strategy. So we prioritize neighborhoods. We do that. We did that by looking at GIS data. And we said um, we came up with 29 criteria based on an analysis of a huge number of different indices. And using social and environment, using that GIS data, we identified the social environmental conditions that locate the most disadvantaged communities. Then we said, OK, let's think about systems and how they work together. So we needed to look at asset condition and we needed to look at where those assets interconnected. And we had a great partner in Streets LA and they have a tremendous amount of data already. And the thing we found out was the biggest barrier was there are just a lot of people that don't have a lot of data. And then we said, how can we get community needs and desires to be included in this question? And then ultimately, how does that add up to a better city, to a you know more sustainable Los Angeles? And that might either be the sustainable development goals they have or the lead goals they're trying to accomplish or some other internal strategic priorities. Um, this was a one year project and we worked on it for two years. So we are now done with this project and it works. And even though it's a pilot, these are screenshots from the pilot. And you can see that upper left corner is me clicking on a census tract, showing how that census tract actually scores in the 29 criteria. So every census tract has a priority score. The higher priority score, a seven and an eight, is super high priority. A one and a two means it's already scoring well. So it's um, its social, environmental, and physical infrastructure needs are lower than other needs. Um, if you go down to the bottom left, this is the Streets LA data that you see in the screenshot. So the red street segments are the highest priority street segments. So in addition to having asset quality needs, they also overlap with four to five other projects in process. So that you can kind of see, it's pretty small, but you can kind of see under um, on that top left column on that bottom left image, street surfacing, tree planting, um, sidewalk uplift, other DOT projects. Like those are the examples of what other projects had to be happening in that location. And then the upper right, it shows a survey. So we created a survey where neighbors could come into their council district, they could prioritize which of the high priority street segments they thought were most important by dragging and dropping that um, list of projects on the bottom right. And that would give 
not only the rank that came from column two, but also, I mean, the score that came from column two, but also the collective ranking from all the surveys that that council received. And then the bottom right is the final screen that shows if we had a future projected, um, right now we're kind of mocking up 2023 and 2028, it would show how has the census tract changed over time? This is what we figured out would be the best way to actually show change over time is to show the actual data in each census tract. And then overall, how has what we actually call the LA equity coefficient. So the gap between the highest performing census tract and the lowest performing census tract, we want that to be as narrow as possible, right? So we want that equity coefficient to say, yeah, there's not a huge gap between the highest performing census tracts and the lowest performing census tracts. And then we also included um, life expectancy. So if life expectancy right now is at 15.5 years and that, in that improves to 14 years, then we know that's a nine and a half percent improvement and things have gotten better. So this is currently a pilot. We have passed it back to the city. They are gonna make some of it um, the the LA Equity map will be available on their internal their, on their geo hub so that internally anybody working on equity can have access to it, and we hope that the rest of the tool will help not only inform how they make decisions but that I can take some of this knowledge to other cities and share it with other cities. Um, so I talked about infrastructural urbanism, and this is sort of a, again just a return to the theory place where we are. And, um, and this is my last slide, the things that I think are big takeaways, just to recap, you know, how do we broaden the process, transform the prototype and measure what matters? Well, our biggest challenges, which you're all familiar with, climate change, extreme wealth disparity, stubborn dysfunction, particularly political dysfunction, and rampant spatial injustices. And I think some immediate opportunities are, you know, after the pandemic, we had some shocks to the system, and that opened up some cracks where change happened and we didn't think change could happen and we could capitalize on that. System symbiosis, I think is a, a, a kind of natural opportunity to say, look, we've already got these systems next to each other. How can we actually create symbiotic relationships between them? Um, there's a lot of federal infrastructure funding coming and we need to be vocal activists about encouraging that funding to do more than just fill potholes and pave roads. Uh, data, data, data. I'm sure you all are familiar with the power of data. Um, how we have more data and more access to data now than we have ever had. And it can be confusing and overwhelming, but can also be used for making a good case. Um, and cross-disciplinary teaching and learning. I am a fan of our dual degrees. So we have students who come in to get master's in architecture, and they can also get a master's of urban design. They have a semester overlap. They can get a master's of architecture, a master's of landscape architecture, and they get a master's of landscape architecture and a master's of urban design. And these really help them and encourage them to think uh, across all the different scales. And all of these things together, I think, shift the paradigm and help us invest in collective optimism. So I'm gonna end there and see if we have some time for questions, maybe a question or two. What is the next project you hope to embark upon now? That's a great um, question. So you heard at the beginning my new jobs. <laughs> so I'm um, I'm starting up as the interim director of our program. I am also um, the chair of urban design. So one of the things we're working on is you know how do we incorporate some of these ideas into our urban design program? So we're the second oldest urban design program in the country. And uh, that's kind of my full-time job at the moment. I am continuing to work on projects with the city of St. Louis. I'm continuing to work with Food Forward. Um, our current project with Food Forward is a partnership with Novo Nordisk. And we are actually trying to use GIS as a way to identify the food gaps. So even though they are, their agency partnerships are widely spread, there are very high need neighborhoods where they don't have a partnership. So that's the current map I'm working on with Food Forward. That's amazing. I love hearing that. Yep. Uh, we also struggle with food deserts here in Chicago too. So I would 
I'm very excited to see that work. Um, hopefully we can implement things in other, other neighborhoods who are struggling. Well, um, there's so much food waste, you know, I mean, what they yeah. do is really um, amazing. They, like I said, I, I think pretty much every place, every city in our country has enough food if they can figure out the mechanisms to, and, and again, they just, they only do fresh produce. They only do fruits and vegetables. They don't do prepared foods. They don't deal with restaurants. Like, and they have such a streamlined system. We've been trying to adapt it at the farmer's market in St. Louis, but it's, you got, you have to have the group in place that manages it. You know, that's part of the trick. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're so passionate about that. I think it's, I think it's really remarkable. And um, we do have another question. Do you see any progress in changing the lines between city and country taxes and governing, et cetera, in the St. Louis area? Right, city and county. Um, so, you know, there was a, there have been efforts to recombine, undivorce, reunite the city and the county. And they have failed for all the reasons they should, right? The last version, um, they wanted to rejoin, but they didn't want to connect the schools. They didn't want to collect the connect the police departments. And those are probably the two areas that are most in need of reform and connectivity. So unless that happens, there's not going to be a connection. Um, our new mayor is more collaborative with the county and the new county supervisor is more collaborative with our mayor. So I think something like transit is getting more collaboration. Um, and that's the north side, south side line is a good place to start. The other project is the brick line greenway. And I was a finalist in a team for that competition. And I think that competition, if, if any of it gets built any more than a couple blocks gets built, it's going to be a nice game changer for the city, but that is regional county and local. So great rivers greenway is a regional greenway system. And so their investment in the city is a nice tie with what's already happening in the county. Well, I appreciate you guys. I I, I saw Carmen said that um, they were a previous GIS specialist and now retired, but I tell you, GIS is booming. So congrats to you for being in on it early. And those are all the questions that we received. And I just want to take a moment to thank everyone for attending today's webinar in, for Women in Geography. And um, thank you again, Linda, for, for participating with us. And I hope you all have a great rest of your evening. All right. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me.